Thank you so much for joining us today for addressing math anxiety in the K-5 classroom for both teachers and parents. My name is Megan Hunter and I'm joined by Bethany Lockhart Johnson. I am part of the Amplify team and we're sponsoring this event because I get to at Amplify work with Bethany Lockhart Johnson. She is our co-host on Math Teacher Lounge with Dan Meyer. It's our video series that's everything K-12 math. So Bethany is an educator of uh, primarily elementary school, which she'll talk a lot about in this webinar, and she's also an author. And prior to serving as a multi-subject teacher, she taught theater and dance and loves incorporating movement and creative play into the classroom. You all are going to see lots about this during this time. One of the things I love about Bethany is she's committed to helping students find joy in discovering their identities as mathematicians. You're really going to walk away from this feeling Bethany's love for mathematics. She is um, also in addition, additional roles to outside of Math Teacher Lounge. She's a Student Achievement Partners California Court Advocate, and she's active in many national and local mathematical organizations, member of the Illustrative Mathematics Elementary Curriculum Steering Committee, and she also has the cutest little son that you'll ever see. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bethany. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for that introduction, Megan. Uh, my, <laughs> I really appreciate everybody joining either right now live or if you're watching this as a recording. I want to uh, say, first of all, before um, we get started, my husband said, you know, I think it's kind of funny that you're having so much like anxiety and nerves about this presentation when this is about math anxiety. I said, is that funny? Is that you think that's funny that I'm this nervous? So I'm going to take, let's take a collective deep breath. Talking about anxiety can sometimes bring up anxiety, but me getting ready for this presentation was not the same as math anxiety. It was excitement because I'm so excited to share this with you and learn together. I want to start by acknowledging that this conversation is part of a much larger and ongoing discussion. And there's many fantastic educators who think about math anxiety and think about how to support students and adults who navigate math anxiety, and I have a lot of their uh, work referenced at the end of this presentation, and um, I just want to thank all of the people who helped contribute their ideas, and as well as some people that I interviewed for this presentation, and I'm going to share some of their voices a little bit later. Um, I also want to say that I do not have all the answers. I've seen this called addressing math anxiety, tackling, navigate. We're going to learn together. We're just going to chat, so let's, <laughs> let's dive in. Uh, Megan already uh, introduced me, but uh, I did receive my uh, BA from University of California, San Diego, and then my master's and multiple subject credential from University of California, uh, Irvine. And um, so I'm in Southern California, and I really appreciate it. I see you guys are from all over. So thank you. So today we're going to talk about defining math anxiety. And again, that definition is how I'll be using it today. There's variations of it. So if I leave out a part, just know that it's multifaceted. Um, we're also going to talk about who's impacted by math anxiety. And I'm going to give ideas for parents or caregivers for students. But for both of those, it's going to be rather brief. The bulk of it is going to be talking about teachers who both navigate math anxiety and especially who are supporting students who navigate math anxiety. I also want um, to say that I'm not specifically talking about dyscalculia, which is more of like um, there, there can be anxiety associated with it, but that's more, um, a, it's a learning difficulty that uh, people navigate and it doesn't necessarily automatically translate to math anxiety. So I want to acknowledge that I do recognize that there's a difference. And so um, you're, if a student is navigating that, it could apply or could not. So I want to start by introducing my son. This is my son. Um, I'd like to say it's time lapse. No, it is time lapse. But this little bundle of energy, this is him after we uh, went to Home Goods. That's usually my reaction after I go to Home Goods. And he, um, you know, I, I really, I love reading to him and I love thinking about ideas to engage him. 
And I found out, by the way, that video you can set to any soundtrack and it works. So I've tried out a wide variety of genres. So I was in Home Goods. They have a huge uh, book selection, board book selection, which who knew? And I'm probably not always going to preview my kiddos' texts, but I was looking for a couple bo- books to get him, and I came across this: "You Be Mommy." A tired mommy lets her daughter have a turn being the parent at bedtime. I'm like, I'm a tired mommy. Maybe this is the right fit. So I'm looking through it, and I came across this page, and I'm going to zoom in on there. She's talking about all the things that she did, you know, that her daughter's going to do when she's mommy, right? When she's mommy. She is going to help with bath time, you know, pack her lunch, whatever. And it, notice it says help with homework, even math. And, you know, it was interesting because this speaks to this kind of larger, like these little jabs at math. And in this picture, I would say that there's a lot of ways to illustrate and talk about help with ho- math homework, right? There could have been a lot of different choices. but this particular image for me really shows some anxiety. It doesn't look like this mom is saying, hmm, let's dive in. Let's tackle that together. Oh, I wonder, what do you think? I mean, there looks like there's a palpable anxiety and stress, right? So we see these images of math anxiety all around us. And so when I talk about math anxiety, I want to share that the Common Core says that students who are successful in math see math as sensible, useful, worthwhile. They believe in diligence. They believe in their own efficacy. And so math anxiety can really really be a block to that ideal. And typically it's defined as a feeling of tension, apprehension, fear that interferes with math performance. We also know that it can cause math avoidance and that can, uh, avoiding certain career paths, avoiding math classes, avoiding with interacting with math. So just last week, actually, I was uh, at Sunil Singh's Math Storytelling, Our Innate Wisdom and Wholeness, and he actually was talking about math anxiety a little bit. And he said that he had Googled math wellness and nothing came up, right? And they, they said, do you mean match wellness? And I loved that he even thought of the idea of math wellness. So my hope is that that's where we're going, math wellness, because I think math anxiety can also really tie into math trauma. And so hopefully we're, we are we are moving towards wellness. So where does math anxiety come from? I have read a lot of articles and and talked to a lot of people about math anxiety. And several of the articles even mention this whole like chicken or the egg phenomenon. Like, does math anxiety cause poor performance in math? Or does poor performance in math lead to math anxiety? Is it more prevalent in girls and women? Do we blame teachers? Do we blame parents? If students are already anxious, are they in general more prone to math anxiety? And I think the answer to all of those is yes, sometimes, maybe. It isn't the same for everyone, right? And so I think while it's important to look at, well, what's the cause of it? Really, we know that when, you know, someone is experiencing math anxiety, some research say that it's using up their, like those feelings of panic are using up their working memory, which is needed to solve problems, which is needed to attend to the details of a problem. And so because that anxiety is using up that working memory, then they're not able to attend to the task, right? And I definitely know when I experienced math anxiety, I certainly couldn't attend to anything except for my panic, right? So I'm not here to convince you to love math or to make it your favorite subject, but I am wanting to invite you to think about the impact of math anxiety on your life and your students and our own relationship to mathematics. And as I was reading about it, there's tons of screenings for math anxiety, right? And this is just a quick snapshot of six that are typically used with younger children. Oftentimes, researchers, you know, they would use images. So You are in math class and your teacher is about to teach something new. So which of those looks like anxiety? They all kind of look like anxiety to me, but it's, you know, uh, typically researchers have studied math anxiety in college students and adults because it's typically, or high school students, 
it's easier to kind of attend to this idea of anxiety. And they thought, well, it really starts when they're older. It really starts when students are in high school and middle school. But more and more researchers are starting to focus on younger kiddos. And they are looking at how can we, you know, at, how can we can have kids communicate what those feelings are, what that feels like to those students. So some researchers, Ganley and McGraw, were um, uh, were very interested in um, working with younger children. And so they they used a scale that had been out there for a while and they added some items. And some of these items were, I get worried before I take a math test, my heart starts to beat faster, I get nervous. And so really trying to understand how students are feeling and feel like they can talk about their math anxiety. You know, and when I say who has math anxiety, I can say adults, teachers, parents, children. And when I read this one article, they said math anxiety can begin as early as the fourth grade and it peaks in middle school and high school. And that really confused me because I'm like, I've experienced math before fourth grade. And I want to share a story. I was student teaching in transitional kindergarten. That picture right there is my amazing mentor teacher, Jennifer Shermont. And um, we were doing kind of an informal one-on-one -on -one assessment, but it was like more of a conversation with the kiddo. And we were asking them about some uh, join problems, some, um, some addition problems. And we had asked like, you know, oh, what's two and three? What's, you know, four and one? And this little kiddo was like, you know, two and three, five, four and one, five, three and one, four. Like, I mean, it was... The fluency to five is a standard at the end of kin by the end of kindergarten. And so that this kiddo knew it in TK, we were like, wow. And we found out that this kiddo, the parents had enrolled him in a program, um, like a, um, one of the for-profit programs uh, name withheld, which was about helping the students achieve a quote a mastery of these facts. So we asked them, my, my mentor teacher said, you know, I have these blocks here. Can you show me what two and three looks like? Two and three together, five, two, and I give you three more. What does that look like with these blocks? And the little boy broke down sobbing. I mean, sobbing. And you could see the palpable fear. And it was that moment of that, like, conceptual. Like, he had the script, two and three is five, four and one is five. But he wasn't able to yet do that conceptual. There's that missing part, right? So I don't want us to think that our youngest students can't experience math anxiety. Somebody else who has math anxiety is little Billy. The new principle hasn't made much difference. We still have math. Like that's the message in family circle. <laughs> that's what the principal is supposed to be working on. Again, those little jabs, they get to me, right? So I want to talk briefly about uh, bringing some voices of parents, caregivers, and other adults. But first, I want to play a short video for you, a 30-second video. Uh, well, so uh, here's the headline. Skyler is one cool kid. Yeah, trust me, uh, he gets that from his mom. <laughs> oh, sweetie. <laughs> well, first of all, we want to thank you for teaching our son to love reading. Yeah, he reads every night now. It's, it's, it's amazing. Well, I mean, he's a smart kid, you know. Uh, the reading part was easy, okay? Uh, the math stuff, however, he, he's having a tougher time with, you know, especially fractions. Right, yeah. Now that he got from me. <laughs> <laughs> so. The rest of that skit goes in a very different direction, but I wanted to pull out that because, again, those messages are everywhere, and I think they really impact the way we think of math, and part of why that's supposed to be funny is that, you know, here's this guy saying that somehow math ability to, to um, make sense of mathematics and to feel successful in mathematics, that you somehow inherit that, or that somehow that if, if your parent's not a math person, then sorry, you're out of luck, right? And as a teacher, I often heard that in parent-teacher conferences. So parents would say, oh, but I'm not a math person. I'm not a numbers person. And I think what is so interesting about that is that it, it almost came out just without even thinking. They wouldn't say, oh, I'm not a good reader or nope, reading, you know, but for math, they felt like they, they could. So a couple of voices I want to bring um, all the names of the interviews I'm going to share have been changed. So these are parents or caregivers. So Renee says she feels like she's had math anxiety her whole life. 
Homework is a battle every night. My daughter asked me for help with her math and it feels like I'm in school all over again. And math now isn't even taught how I learned it. Every time I try to help, she just says that's not how her teacher wants her to do it. Homework time usually ends up in tears, hers and mine. Sasha, I was working at a clothes store. They had me on the register and I thought it would be fine because the machine does all the totals and change. But then one day a customer kept questioning her total. Her clothes were on sale and were 15% off. She kept saying it was 15% off and 20% off with her coupon. She was telling me it was 35% off the whole total, but no matter what I entered, I just kept getting a different number than what she said, and she was so mad. There was a long line, and I felt like my brain was just frozen. My manager finally had to come and rescue me, and I mean it when I say rescue. I felt like I was going to pass out. Andres, father of two, I am not a math or numbers person. When I was a kid, I was pulled out of class a lot because of my asthma. The school gave me tutoring when I came back, and I could do problems with the tutors, but when they'd give me more of the same type of problem, I'd just choke. I went to summer school, but the teachers I had there didn't seem to care much. It was just an easy pass for credits. Math is the number one reason I don't have a college degree. I just couldn't cut it in college math classes, and I had to take them for my GE. And when I talk to parents or caregivers, adults, uh, again and again, I hear this theme of an alienation from math that they're not a math or a numbers person. They, they convey that there's some special identity for those for whom that like math comes easily for this one group of people. A uh, fear of navigating math in public spaces, including avoiding navigating numbers, budgets, bills. I want to bring in some student voices. This is Carrie. She's now an eighth grader, but she was reflecting on when she was in fourth grade. Math was after lunch and I hated it so much. I sometimes would get a stomach ache. Sometimes I'd get to go to the nurse office, even if I just felt fine. I'd say I was sick. I'd miss math and it was good, but then when I came back, I didn't know what was going on. So it just got worse and worse. Ryan, at the start of sixth grade, my math teacher said, you guys learned all this last year. And then she really rushed through the steps of the problem. I had no idea how she got the answers. I guess I was supposed to learn it in fifth grade, but I hadn't. I didn't want to raise my hand to ask. And there was one more voice, um, which, sorry, did not make it in. I want to make sure I share that uh, Carlos's voice, another student said that he would just write the numbers in, into the homework, and the teacher would come around and just make sure it was like complete and not actually, there was no check for understanding. There was no application of the homework into the lessons. And so he felt like this wasn't about sense making, right? This was just busy work. This was just something to do to, to get the grade. And so students often recount a moment of math trauma or multiple moments. They see it as something they just have to get through. They're told not to use their fingers or tools. No memory of a lesson or strategy that's been taught. They remember teachers who privilege certain students or students' ability to, serve, to solve problems quickly. And finally, I want to share some teachers' voices. Chelsea's a second-year teacher. She's newly graduated from a multiple-subject credential program. She says when she was a pre-service teacher, there was a total disconnect between what she was learning in her classes and what her mentor or teacher was doing at her site placement. When I asked my mentor teacher about it, she said that my university program was great, but idealistic. And once I had 30, class, 30 kids at all different levels, I would be more inclined to stick to the teacher guide and stay on pace with my team. My mentor teacher was such a good teacher, and I really struggled with what she said and what my assignments and professors were asking me to do. Dustin. He's a seventh, seventh year teacher, and he says he's always taught by the book, and he tried to do something new after they had a PD in school about student-led discussions. So I got observed last year, and the principal came in right during math. I was trying to do a share out of student solutions, and I had no idea what the student had done to solve the problem. In that moment, my class felt like total chaos, and I had no idea where to take the lesson next. And finally, Marissa, fourth grade teacher. We were in a teacher training about our new math curriculum. We had to find the tens in 430, 430. I said three, and I got it wrong. It was 43. For a second, I could not figure out what I had done wrong, and the rest of my team seemed totally fine with the problem. That's not how I learned or taught tens in the past, and it just is a new way to think about numbers. I feel like that's the whole book, asking us to look at numbers and problem solving in a way that's completely different from how I was taught to teach math. I'm not saying I'm not open to it, but I guess I'm just really struggling to make sense of it. And I'm supposed to be able to get up and teach it to students. How do I do that if I don't get it? 
And themes I hear from teachers, they dread teaching math or professional development that's focused on math. They have a sense that they don't know enough math in order to venture away from the textbook. Frustration with changes in math curriculum and uncertainty about how to support students who dislike or struggle with math. And another thing that I heard often, um, the one teacher, um, uh, let me go back for a second, Dustin, he had said that, you know, they actually were kind of auditing math minutes. And he found out that a lot of the teachers had less math minutes, less instructional minutes. There was this creep into math minutes, right? Is there were assemblies during math time or there was some special thing that had to be completed. Oh, we'll just do it at the end of math. And so actually the creep was happening where those instructional minutes overall, while it may have been a couple minutes here and there, really added up over the course of the year. And those minutes add up. And why do I care about it? And it's because I had a very, very anxious math career. I really struggled. That's me in sixth grade. And that's me in 10th grade. And sixth grade me was just starting to dip their toe into math anxiety. I had um, missed some important math content and things at home were really such that school was just no longer a priority. And it became really difficult. And I remember my teacher just saying, oh, well, you're behind, but just tonight do tonight's homework and then do a past assignment. And their answer was just, well, just do more work and you'll get it. And it just got progressively more and more difficult. And the picture on the right, when I was in 10th grade, I had a teacher who told me, said the words, you don't belong here in math class. And I talked about this in a ShadowCon presentation that I did. Um, and the thing about it is that I feel like you know, I've spent almost half our time talking about math anxiety, but the reason is, is that I really hope that our, like, we're able to recognize ourselves in some of these stories or maybe recognize some of your students. And I found that for me, it seemed like my classmates just knew how to do it. And I didn't feel like I recognized myself in any of their struggles. So just realizing that others had math anxiety was really powerful for me. And it really felt like, okay, I'm not alone. So. What I want to talk about now, I want to talk about briefly what parents and caregivers, some ideas, again, my goal is not to fix or say I have the answers, but I want to talk briefly about parents and students. And again, not to make it go away magically, but to make space, acknowledge it, navigate it. I think in the process, it can also help heal your own math anxiety. If you navigate math anxiety um, while you're uh, supporting your students, you can also heal your own. Then I'm going to talk briefly about students. And then I'm going to end uh, by talking about some uh, resources for teachers. So the first thing I say, and I want to be clear that I don't say this like, you know, oh, just make math fun. But part of healing our relationship with math is starting to develop a new relationship with math, with what math is, what math can be, and what math looks like. And so part of that can be Having actual experiences that even look like fun, even if for you in the classroom or in other math spaces, math was anything but fun. One way that could be a family math night where there's games, there's scavenger hunts, there's, you know, not a focus, estimation stations, there's not a focus on competition, it's really on community. Um, uh, there are games like shoots and ladders or quicks, which are fun to play, but are actually enhancing um, number sense. There are shows like Team Umizumi, which sadly is no longer on, but you can still find it. And um, they're talking about measurement and using math vocabulary. And I want to give a major shout out to Christopher Danielson. He and his team uh, in Minnesota, the Minnesota State Fair, have something called, oh, I'm sorry, typo, math on a sticker. It's math on a stick. I apologize. Um, I think my autocorrect was like, how could it be math on a stick? It must be math on a sticker. So his website, Talking uh, Math with Kids. This, uh, it's a space at the Minnesota State Fair. So you go get your fried pickle and go look at the animals and see which one and then go into this space. And as you see, there's this parent and kiddo who are, you know, working with these tools that maybe they've seen in their math classes, but this is just about engaging and exploring together. So I think that fun can be something that can be really healing for our relationship with math. I also want to shout out Omo Moses in Math Teacher Lounge. We had a chance uh, to interview Mr. Moses. He has an organization called Math Talk. 
And I love this quote from their website that research shows that when parents and young children take time to explore, enjoy, and talk about math together, it sets the stage for positive early math experiences and help young children view themselves as capable math learners. But then they also acknowledge that even though, yes, research says that, that we may not know how to do that. What does that mean, explore, enjoy, and talk about math together? If I'm experiencing math anxiety, that's the last thing that I really know how to do. And so their organization, they have some online tools as well as some apps that you can, an app you can download where you can take public spaces, like here's a picture on the left of a park, and you see that they've the app has helped you like kind of see it in another space where these shapes, like how would I interact if this space had this circle here, these shapes. And um, Mr. Moses also has a great book called Sometimes We Do. And in that book, a family is talking about ways that math shows up in their life. And, you know, again, while every parent, they say, Math Talk, while every parent might want to ensure that their child's earliest math learning experiences are positive, understandably, many simply don't know where to begin. And that is a totally like normal and, re- and reasonable thing. And in that picture, there's they have this one task that's a gigantic number line that you can make so you can see how long is it, how many steps do we get to school? And these can be ways that you're reframing and again, healing your relationship with math. I also want to um, give a shout out, Kristen Gray, an amazing educator. She's the former director of the K-5 curriculum and professional learning at Illustrative Mathematics. And they did this beautiful project during uh, the, you know, remote, more remote learning, and it's called Talking Math. And so every day they have over a hundred images. They have an image like these oranges, and then they have ideas. And this can be for educators, but also really I'm highlighting it in the parent space because it it can be for parents. So how many do you see? How do you see them? And you are talking about quantity. You are having students share what they notice, but it's not about a right or a wrong. It's about noticing. And so depending on what grade your kiddo is in, you can start there. You can jump to another question. And these type of things that are out there and are free are a way, again, to dip your toe into math and into reframing what math can look like without having to, you know, enroll in a, in a, in a program that's going to, you know, be a drill program or say, you know, I have to automatically totally reshape my experience, my relationship with math. No. What if we just look at that picture or look at somebody skateboarding outside and say, you know, ask these questions. What questions do you have in that image? What questions do you have about this picture? And it's just, it's a wondering. And I loved this work that Kristen Gray and her team did because, again, it's really about reshaping what mathematics can look like. Talking math, so beautiful. And I have the link in the, in the references at the end. A big thing I say for parents is really to examine your own conversations about mathematics. So a lot of times, just like in that book, we hear, oh, I've, oh you know, I, I've always hated math too. Or they might say, oh, I'm not a math person. or you look at that check. I'm not a numbers person. This isn't how I learned it. Why did they change math? And these little comments can really impact the way that we internalize our own relationship with mathematics and the way that our students, our children, excuse me, hear us relating with mathematics. Again, you don't have to pretend it's your favorite subject, but just notice, okay, by me telling my student, my kiddo who is, you know, having trouble navigating this assignment, am I actually you know, helping if I say, don't worry, I'm not a math person either. What message are they getting about their abilities and their own self-concept? I want to flag again, Renee, from our, the beginning of uh, the presentation. Renee was talking, homework is a battle every night. Homework time usually ends up in tears, hers and mine. I want to take a moment to talk about homework. I am definitely somebody who assigns homework to my kiddos. I think there can be Uh, benefit from homework. But I want to say that one thing, you don't have to know how to do all the homework. You can seek out community resources. I didn't know that the library right down the street from me gave homework help for free or that the local community college had homework help for free. If you can, communicate with your child's teacher about what's going on. And I say if you can, because I have met parents who have said, 
you know, my teacher doesn't seem receptive or I've emailed the teacher and I haven't heard back. And that could be for a variety of reasons, but it's worth trying if you haven't yet communicated with your child's teacher about homework or about what you're navigating. And then another thing I want to say is avoid the homework battles, even if that means sometimes you opt out. And I say this because I have had experiences with parents where they've told me that they, again, just like Renee shared, that they were in tears. They were crying. Their child was crying. It was a battle. And cultivating and maintaining a positive relationship around math and schoolwork in general is so much more important than one assignment. And as a teacher, if a parent ever came to me and said, you know, we, we didn't complete this or, hey, you know, is there some other way that I can engage with my kid around math because this isn't working. It's a battle every night. I would be so grateful that they shared that with me. That's an insight to say, you know, this isn't serving its purpose. This homework isn't serving its purpose. So while I do think homework can be valuable, I think it also can be a space to opt out. Students. So if you're a student, I encourage you to examine your own story and feel free to rewrite it. You know, that teacher who said, you don't belong here, they could have meant like, hey, you know what? I want you to be in a class where you feel like the content is more aligned with where you're at so that you can really feel successful in math. But the words they say said were, you don't belong here. And the story I made that mean was, I don't belong here. I don't belong in mathematics. I don't belong in this class. I don't belong in this space. I can't do this. So I needed to examine that so that I could then reframe it for myself. Like, what would it look like if I do belong here? Where do I belong? And how can I start carving out that space for myself? And I had to acknowledge that that was deeply painful. Not only that experience, but then other experiences I had with math trauma, with math anxiety. And, you know, I've jokingly said like, oh, you know what? Well, I bet your teacher never said, you know, that you need, to, you don't belong in your math class. Ha ha ha. But really that was painful. And how can we acknowledge that and look at that? Um, another thing, and you don't have to read all of this. This is basically saying that, you know, that there's researchers who showed that writing about your math experience was incredibly powerful before an exam, before a class, freely writing about their emotions for 10 to 15 minutes regarding an upcoming math exam. Again, it, it actually served, they think, to free up some of that, that working memory. All that energy, that fight or flight, that panic was able to have a space to go. It didn't mean that magically a student understood concepts that were difficult or didn't feel nervous about a test at all. But if you're a student, can you carve out some time to try writing about it and try writing about your experience? Mostly I want to highlight this. I found this in an article and it's one of my favorite things ever. The Math Anxiety Bill of Rights for students who navigate math anxiety. And a couple that I want to highlight. I have the right to ask whatever questions I have. I have the right to need extra help. I have the right to view myself as capable of learning math. And I wonder what difference it would have made if I had heard these messages, or what if I shared some of this with my students, or what if we created a math anxiety bill of rights in our own class? What, what could that mean for a student? What could that mean for me as a student? So now let's dive into teachers. And again, I know we only dipped our toe into talking about parents and uh, students, but I also think that some of the teacher stuff can be applicable. So I'm going to talk about two parts. What can you do if you have math anxiety as a teacher? And what can you do if you're supporting students who have math anxiety? So I'm trying to touch on both of those. I definitely think that they overlap. So I mentioned very briefly earlier that in 2019, I was able to share my story at um, the National Council of Teacher of Mathematics annual conference, uh, national conference. And it's they have a night called ShadowCon and where it's educators get to uh, speak about an experience, right? Usually connected to math. And I shared about my own math anxiety and I shared about fear uh, as a teacher, how my fear was actually holding me back from certain experiences as a teacher for my students and for myself. And right after me, 
Um, I mean, I was feeling pretty proud of myself and brave for sharing this because it was the first time I'd really talked about my math anxiety in person. And right after uh, me, this uh, amazing, amazing educator, Chris No. Um, this is a picture of him actually at Math on a Stick um, at the fair. I love this picture, his profile picture. And he decided that he, um, his was about, well, actually, let me just show you a brief clip. So I'm going to show you about uh, two minutes of his talk. This is the beginning of his talk. Uh, I actually want to kick off my ShadowCon talk here by admitting to everyone something. I'm really jealous of our teachers. Uh, and here's why. So what you're looking at right now is a photo taken by an artist. His name is Cecil McDonald Jr. And it's from his book, In the Company of Black. Uh, these portraits are accompanied with poems that are written by another artist, Avery R. Young. And I'm showing you this photo because one evening, the art teacher from my school, her name's Nicole, uh, she forwarded me an email with the subject line, Upcoming Teacher Workshop exploring text and image with Avery R. Young and Cecil McDonald Jr. And it was being held close to my house, and Nicole is my friend, so I decided to go. Uh, so I entered this room, and it's like 20 or so arts educators in there, and I really quickly realized that teacher workshop is not exactly what I was expecting it to be. Like when I think teacher workshop, I think take the next five minutes to turn and talk. Uh, but what I stepped into could probably be better described as an artist's workshop. We were going to be learning by doing art. So we spent the evening, and we're walking around this beautiful art center. We're taking photos. We're writing poems. And eventually, we're sharing them with each other. And throughout this evening, I see this room of 20 or so arts teachers transform into a room full of artists. It's unlike any PD I've ever experienced in math education. They were tending to their identities as artists, not art teachers. So I'm jealous of art teachers because there seems to be this like thin line between what it means to be an art teacher and an artist. I mean, just imagine the ideal art teacher out there, right? And how strange it would be if they really shied away from saying, oh, no, 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 I'm not an artist. Right? Now contrast that with the beliefs about how math teachers and mathematicians feel. Mm. Right? A lot of the times I know I shy away from labeling myself as a mathematician. And I know so for some people out there, you might not even like math teacher. Maybe you prefer a teacher of math. So right now I want to dig into why is that? Chris goes on, Chris No goes on to say, really invite us to think about our identity as a mathematician. And one of the things he talks about is, you know, artists have this space where they can cultivate their art identity, but and they have this work that they can show. But what about a math teacher? What about a, a where do you cultivate your identity as a mathematician? And I remember really feeling like this was a powerful invitation because the moment he said math teacher as a mathematician, I felt that same, same like grip of anxiety, like, oh, but I'm not a mathematician, right? I'm not a mathematician. And one of the powerful things that Chris says is he says, when our identity transforms, our practice transforms. So as a teacher who is navigating math anxiety, the more work I do on my identity of, in this case, looking at my math anxiety and looking at what is that block to me identify as a mathematician, the more that my practice can transform and that I can be more present with my students and with helping to shape their identity as mathematicians. And I would say to my kids in class, like, oh, all right, mathematicians, let's, you know, let's get ready for this assignment. But was I really sitting in that identity for myself? And so for me, after, after NCTM, for me, I kind of took it as a time to reflect on, well, what is a mathematician? What does it mean to be a mathematician? And the first thing that came to mind for me was thinking about the standards, the Oh, and that's my nervous face. Remember that that last quiz? If the if the researcher had asked me how I was feeling, that is how I was feeling. The most anxious mathematician. So for me, it was helpful to turn to the standards for mathematical practice. And the reason I start with this is just to say that these, you know, eight different points, they span K, they're not like the standards where they're they're really about a specific grade level or a grade band. These span K through 12. And these are 
ways to think about mathematics and the practice of doing math, right? So really thinking about the work of mathematics, and it's not a checklist. It's saying, you know, as a mathematician, I can make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. I can look for and make use of structure. And for me, thinking about these things that are more less about the a specific math concept and more about just the practice of mathematics, it was helpful for me to start thinking about, well, why can't I think of myself as a mathematician? I am doing these things. I am working to do these things. I am working to bring these things into my lesson. And I am working to understand that being a mathematician does include taking risks and making mistakes. And so there's also ways that they have structured the standards for mathematical practices into these groupings, these overarching habits of mind for a productive mathematical thinker, however you want to call that. But for me, it was about these ideas about what being a mathematician can mean. And so for teachers, I think a powerful moment for me in reclaiming mathematics, that's the way I describe it, I reclaimed math, was to deepen my content knowledge. And there's a lot of text on this page, and I don't expect you to read it, but what I want you to just see is that this is part of the progressions for the Common Core State Standards in Mathematics. And this was actually created before the standards, and it doesn't necessarily anymore directly align with standards, but it's thinking about the way that students make sense of math concepts, the way that they develop these ideas conceptually, um, the way abstractly, the way that they work through a concept. So you see there's progression on geometry, measurement and data. And for me, it was really helpful to dive into these when we started a new unit. And I didn't, it's not like I did this every time, but let's say um, a unit on, um, uh, if I was teaching a unit on, ge on geometry, it was helpful for me to kind of think about where do these conversations go go in geometry? Where What is the progression that these students are working towards? And again, just dipping my toe into that. And I say that a lot because for me, that's a way of me thinking like, I don't have to like totally dive in and submerge, submerge myself. I'm just going to check it out and see. But I want to flag that in case you had never heard of it because the progressions were a way for me to help make sense of some content knowledge. I frequently hear that math, that math teachers feel like they are missing math content. They're missing, you know, oh, well, I'm not good at math or I don't feel confident enough. Like Dustin was saying, he had always taught by the book, right? He had taught by the book. And so for him, deepening his math content was a way that he could start feeling more confident in trying um, trying new things in his class. Same with Marissa. She said, you know, I had to relearn, I had to learn how to think about tens in a new way. I also want to share, um, Achieve the Core has a wonderful site called the Coherence Map. So I have a really quick little video I'm just going to talk over. So the Coherence Map, if you dive in, you can select your grade band. So for this case, I'm, I'm selecting kindergarten. And it has the major work of the grade and the supporting standards as well. So looking at, um, looking at one of the major clusters, I can look at what standards support that and where does it go? So after kindergarten, in this number, number and operations in base 10, that's starting to think about place value. I can think, okay, here we are in kindergarten, but this is where it goes in first grade. This is where it goes, you know, if I want to map this standard too. This is where it goes next, right? How do I think about place value in kindergarten matters how my students are going to understand and make sense of place value in first grade, in second grade, in fourth grade. And then I show you the progression all the way to fourth grade, right? Thinking about fractions. Well, thinking about the way we work with whole numbers is 100% going to think going to impact the way we work with fractions. And so for me, looking at the coherence map is another way to deepen your content knowledge. And again, I do not think it's going to be every single every single new unit. I have to dive into all these resources. What I want you to know about is that they exist. And so if there's an area that feels sticky or that feels like I have a lot of anxiety around, uh, I, a lot of teachers I talked to said fractions was, or was when they started to panic. Well, can you go to the progression documents or can you go to the coherence map and look at the way that these previous previous standards build to fractions? and that you can support students. Because if students have um, content that they, you know, I hear a lot about missing content, especially being remote learning. And 
Instead, it's like, well, it's just unfinished learning, right? Like there, we may need some more support. And that doesn't mean I go back and teach all of first grade again, right? In fourth grade. But it means I can say, oh, I can support with these concepts here to help them understand these current fourth grade standards. Because I want what I want to teach for all of my students is that grade level content. But I recognize there's going to be support needed. There's going to be scaffolding needed. I have students who have a wide variety of, of backgrounds in math. So another invitation and a way to deepen your content knowledge is to learn alongside. For me, it was really important that I started building a community of people who are thinking about math. And I want to highlight Teresa Wills. She has uh, Mather Days. Math so fun. We do it on Saturdays. And it's funny because when I went on her site to grab the screen screenshot, it was um, ratios and rates, right? That was November 6th. I did not attend that, that Mather Day. But I got to tell you, I felt that like... <gasps> I don't know anything about ratios and rates, you know, or not enough to, to certainly feel like I could talk about it with, with uh, any level of confidence or know what questions to ask. But this is a space where I could go and just kind of just participate as much or as little as I want to, right? And just help deepen my content knowledge, learn alongside, which is a whole variety of, of topics and a lot from the past that you can go back and, and uh, view again. Another uh, space to help build that math community, because I think it's so important to build that community and those allies and that space where you start re repairing your relationship with mathematics and, and re-envisioning what that could look like. You can join in the conversation or just lurk on Twitter, MTBOS, Math Twitter Blogosphere, or Elementary Math Chat. Those are two, there's tons of math hashtags, but these are two that I think can have really, really interesting conversations and a way to see how other educators are um, you know, thinking about math, how they're navigating sometimes their own math anxiety. Sometimes they're just being, you know, they're, they're just sharing things they did in their classroom. They're asking questions. I posted student work, uh, with permission that didn't have, you know, that I said, can you help me make sense of what this student is doing? Um, I want to, I want to really understand and help dive in. Cause I think I'm going to use it for a share out. Uh, and so just peeking at the last couple of days, even, I mean, these are some of the if you look at these images, there's like invitations to participate. There's Zach Champagne, another another um, edu amazing educator who's thinking about student sense making. And, you know, you look at these and you're just like, there's such a variety of experiences that folks are having with math. It would never occur to me to carve math onto a pumpkin, but I really liked seeing that picture. And, you know, there's ways to engage. And so if you haven't participated in, in any of these hashtags, I, I invite you to follow them. Um, I talked earlier about writing and making space for your own math story. I just want to highlight that again because I just think it's so important that we as teachers recognize that we have we bring that story into the classroom with us. And that's also transitioning into thinking about students' math story, right? So in the article Math Curse or Math Anxiety, they recommend a math survey and some of the questions that you could give to your students. Compared with other students in my class, I feel that I do better, worse, about the same as they do in math class. I think that my parents like or dislike math. Explain your answer. My best, worst experience in math was when? If I could change one thing about my math class, it would be. And um, a friend of mine said that her son came home with an assignment, was asked to do a mathography. And the questions were really about their experience with math. And it was talking about recognizing you're coming into my class, her son's in high school, having a history with mathematics, and I want to know about it. And I think, you know, there's such power in acknowledging your story, but also in having your story seen. And so for a teacher to say to me, like, hey, I want to know about what your experiences were with math. I want to know what our, like, let's shape our experience together. I think can be so incredibly powerful. And when I have asked my students about what math is, especially when I have kindergarten students, it's so interesting how some of them already have these preconceived notions, right, of mathematics and what it is. And so it's great to be able to make space for that in your classroom. So if you're supporting, a, uh, if you're a teacher supporting students who have math anxiety, a few things I want to say is that I want to consider that students need and are worthy of multiple rich opportunities to engage in problem solving and sense making processes. And that's going to look different. So they need multiple opportunities because each one they're going to interact with them differently. 
Students are capable of making sense of a given context. They bring in a tremendous amount of knowledge and schema to the math classroom. And they're influenced by your disposition as a teacher of mathematics and your classroom environment. And so one of my favorite articles was really talking about enhancing student self-concept. And by self-concept, they referred to self-concept and self-efficacy as competence beliefs. So the expectations that you're like, I am capable of doing this. So a student's what they feel when they enter into this, this math space or any space, knowing I can learn this or I can perform this action. And math self-concept, they assessed it using items such as how good the students thought they were at math how well they expected to do in the future in math, and how good they thought they would be at learning something new in math. And sadly, and not surprisingly, the researchers found that lower levels of math self-concept correlated with higher levels of anxiety, and higher levels of math anxiety correlated with lower levels of self-concept, right? And they had a direct impact with each other. So what I want to think about is what are some what are some ways that our classroom can be an environment where students feel safe taking risks as they share their sense making, where they are building up their self-concept so that those anxiety levels are reduced? So consider a classroom space where students solve problems in ways that make sense to them. And this little girl here, she is sharing the way she made sense of a problem, right? She has that agency. She's talking about it. She's she spelled out her thinking in a way that made sense to her. She drew images that made sense to her. Consider classroom routines that help broaden what doing math looks and feels like. And remember that tool use, consider a space where tool use is a part of the sense-making process and is celebrated. And I'm going to briefly, briefly run through some routines that you can uh, consider and talk a little bit about tool use. So a few routines that can help reimagine what math doing math looks and feels like is which one doesn't belong. This is something where students are invited to think of why does each, what is the reason why each one doesn't belong? And again, it's a way that students can just have a conversation and you're doing math, but it gets to look different. Counting collections. Uh, Angela Turo, Elham Kazemi, and Megan Frankie have an amazing book, Coral Collections and Counting Collections. Um, and this is an image from my classroom, the student who was um, working with their counting collections and making sense of how to make sense of this huge quantity. Notice wonder. This is an image I projected in my classroom. And, you know, you'll get, I got questions, I got uh, notice things like, I noticed there's a number in the corner. I noticed that the haystack looks like a tree stump. I noticed there's a bush behind the pumpkin. Another, I wonder why they look like they're doing yoga. They thought that those green planks looked like yoga mats. Why are there seven pumpkins? Why are they different colors? Why is one as big of a house? Again, these are ways for students to participate in sense-making in an environment that's lower risk. You're redefining and reshaping what math can look and feel like, and you're helping to cultivate a relationship with mathematics, a positive relationship. Another routine is what is same, what is different. These are two images. So projecting the image of the elephant and the feather, what's the same and what's different, or which one's bigger, which one's you know, thinking of which one's heavier, which one's bigger, which one's lighter, having the conversation, bringing out that math vocabulary. What's the same? What's the difference? Showing those, those dinosaur images. And again, students are going to count them. There is going to be counting involved, but this is a way that um, students can engage in those conversations. I want to also talk about celebrating mathematical residue. So these are two routines, the one on the uh, left about the number 10. This is... Um, I asked students to tell me about the number 10 and my students said things like, oh, that's her number. I'm going to be 10 in some years. Uh, somebody else said, oh, we use a 10 frame, you know, and then I invited them to have, I had left post-its and a, and a pen, a pencil out. And so if they thought of other things, this is a poster without the post-its, they could go back and they could put those post-its on. And I love post-its and these students love post-its. Um, ways to make 14, students shared a bunch of different ways to make 14. And then during our share out, we talked about the connections they saw. So a student saw nine and five, they said, well, that's like this one, the four plus one plus nine. And so I got to have a conversation. Well, what do you mean? That looks very different from, to me. And they said, well, I know four and one is five. So they're bringing these connections, right? And then I had post-its out. It's this mathematical residue. So these Students were continuing to think about this and they were adding post-its over the week, just like, and then we kept the post, the poster up. Um, celebrating tool use. 
So think about what tool use looks like in your classroom. Are we telling kids that tools will um, make sense for them? Or like, are we telling them what tools to use? Like, oh, use this to solve this problem. Are we letting them decide what will make sense for them? Are the tools in your classroom easily accessible? And do you celebrate the use of the tools? Or is it, or is, you know, do students feel like, oh, I shouldn't use tools. They're going to think I don't know how to do it. Uh, on the left here is a, um, is a, a great article, Got Tools. And on the right, the tools poster is um, we added to this. So on the very first day, we put pencil and talked about how that's a tool. We put clipboard, we put two color counters. And so over the year, we kept adding, adding images of tools. And we talked about if a student was uh, stuck on, a, on a, a problem. We said, is there a tool that could help? And they'd go over and they'd, you know, look at the, look at the poster. And so I hear teachers say, but what if the, the students make a mess? What if they play with the tools? What if they get dependent on tools to solve problems? You know, there probably will be some messes. They may play with them sometimes, but I don't think they're going to get dependent on using the tools. They're going to use it as sense-making. And if you celebrate it, it can be a natural part of the sense-making routine. This is an image of a student showing how he used these tools to help him solve a problem. Uh, I want to flag making connections through storybooks can be a way to help students connect and reimagine mathematics. There's an amazing book, I'm so excited, coming out, I think, in December uh, through Stenhouse, and it is called Mathematizing Children's Literature, Allison Hintz and Anthony Smith. I'm very excited um, and really thinking about how we use books that are like math storybooks and books that we wouldn't even imagine could be mathematized. Bring families along with the journey. So you can consider assignments that encourage conversations, uh, communicate with families via, like I would do Zoom recordings where I'm talking about the unit and talking about where I'd show images of how students might have solved or how we did a share out. Family letters, you can use something from your textbook or create your own. Inviting your students to write about it, making sense making space for that for them. And again, it's students are being asked their, your thoughts and feelings regarding the exam you're about to take. And also choosing tasks that allow for multiple points of entry. You know, all of these standards here can be addressed in a variety of ways, right? We can address it here. We can make the choice to do something like this. And to be clear, the goal on this is move fast, but then they say, say what their goal is. Or we can look at it by something that is more open-ended like ways to make 10 through a storytelling context, like about rabbits. And I got responses to this that were images and that also students that wrote equations and wrote, wrote their thinking out, right? You can take things from a textbook. Like this is saying, essentially they want you to write nine plus zero equals nine, but you could go this route or you can ask a question that connects your class mascot and op an open invitation that's going to generate student sense making. And I want to share a couple resources before we wrap up. The incredible book, Becoming the Math Teacher You Wish You'd Had by Tracy Johnston Zager. Um, and there's some others listed. FactsWise, amazing fluency program that changed the way I thought about fluency standards. And you can always check out Math Teacher Lounge. And I want to say the references are listed here if you're interested. I know we didn't get to questions, but EdWeb is going to send me um, the question list so that I can address them. And I can make sure that we uh, get those, some of those questions answered. And I deeply appreciate your time. I was just going to say, Bethany, how about we um, send you the questions from the Math Teacher Lounge Twitter? If you don't follow Bethany Lockhart ADU, once we receive those questions, you could reply on there. Uh, MathTeacherLounge.com is our video series that Bethany co-hosts with Dan Meyer. Topics from K-12, everything timely mathematics. So be sure to join uh, the Math Teacher Lounge to continue the conversation. And thank you so much, Bethany. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. A lot of information, but it was so fun to, to share the space with you. Thank you. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. Bye.